Welcome to Fair Vote Toronto's monthly webinar series. My name is Megan Matz, and I'm a volunteer with the Toronto chapter of Fair Vote Canada, and I'll be facilitating this webinar tonight. So I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement and a statement of support. So as we join tonight online from all over Canada, we at Fair Vote Toronto wish to acknowledge that the land on which we join you from has for thousands of years been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of Credit River. So tonight, uh, sorry, today, Toronto is home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to them for the opportunity to work on this land. In the interest of our shared values of freedom, fairness, and cooperation, we would like to declare our support for proportional representation. Though there's much work to be done in this country to achieve a just and fair society for all, abandoning the winner takes all mentality of our current voting system is an important step in achieving our goals as it would allow every Canadian to make their voice heard electorally and ensure politicians prioritize what Canadians care about. So now for a brief introduction of our organization, Fair Vote Canada is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization advocating for a citizens' assembly on electoral reform in Canada and its provinces. Fair Vote Toronto is one of the many chapters across the country, which helps the organization to lobby local MPs and mobilize at the grassroots level. So, with these webinars, we're hoping to connect the issue of proportional representation to all other pressing issues to demonstrate that electoral reform is an important route of political change. Tonight, for the second installment of our webinar series, our guest speaker is a public policy researcher based out of Vancouver. He's an adjunct prof at SFU, was the founding director of CCPA's BC office, and the author of recently released book, A Good War, Mobilizing Canada for the Climate Emergency. He's also an advocate um, in support of BC's 2018 referendum on proportional representation. So please welcome Seth Klein. Hi, nice to be with you. Great, thanks so much for joining us, Seth. So the format tonight will consist of a short talk from Seth, followed by a Q&A about climate and proportional representation. At the end, we'll take questions from the audience. So throughout the hour, please submit any questions you have to the Q&A box through Zoom or the YouTube stream comments section if you're watching from there. So Seth, take it away. Well, thanks very much. And, and thanks to all of you. I see there's nearly 150 of you now. So thank you so much for your interest and in, in, uh, joining in tonight. It's great to be with you. And uh, thank you to Fair Vote Toronto for this invitation. I, I also want to start by acknowledging uh, that while you are all over the country on the lands of many Indigenous nations, I am on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. I, I, I realize land acknowledgements for a virtual event may be a bit odd, but uh, one of the things I argue in the book is that recognition and assertion of Indigenous rights and title, I believe is central to winning this existential fight. And, uh, and actually the chapter in the book on Indigenous leadership and the climate mobilization is uh, it's one of my favorites. So um, I'm gathering that we're going to talk a little bit more about proportional representation in the discussion. Um, but for an opener, you'd like me to, to offer some opening comments about the book. Um, so I hope and think that the book makes an important contribution to this moment and, and that it calls on us to adopt an entirely new and different approach to the climate crisis than the one that we have pursued to date. And while the book endeavors to tell the truth about the severity of the crisis that we face, I also actually hope and believe that, that you will find it an unusually hopeful book given the subject matter. So as the title suggests, I am convinced that to confront the climate emergency, a wartime approach is needed. And moreover, that our wartime experience should be embraced as a hopeful story. Now, there's no small irony in me coming to this place. And like many of you, I'm sure I too wrestle with the war analogy. I actually cut my political teeth in the peace movement uh, as an activist, uh, teenage activist in Montreal. Uh, I, am, I am the child of Vietnam War resistors. That is why I happen to be Canadian. But I am now strongly of the view that climate breakdown requires a new mindset to mobilize all of society and to galvanize our politics and to fundamentally remake our economy. And, 
And the reason I say that is because I take as an opening premise in the book that everything we have been doing isn't working. If you look at a, you know, were I to show you a graph as I do in the book of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions going back the last 20 years, what you would just see is a flat line. That is what we have managed to do in 20 years is simply to flatline our emissions. We have failed to bend the curve. We have really run out the clock with these distracting debates about incremental changes and where it matters most, actual greenhouse gas emission reductions, we have accomplished precious little. And so uh, we need a new approach. Um, the, the book project began uh, as an exploration of, of how we can align our politics and economy in Canada with what the science says we must urgently do to address the climate emergency. And, and the book is still that. Um, I had always planned to include a chapter on lessons from the Second World War for rapid transformation, rapid economic transformation. But as I delved into that work, I began to see more and more parallels between our wartime experience and the current crisis. And I ultimately decided to structure the entire book around lessons from Canada's Second World War experience, hence the, the title. I don't do this because I get all weirdly animated about war. Rather, it is because I see in the history of our wartime experience this helpful and, in fact, hopeful reminder that we have done this before. We have mobilized in common cause across society to confront an existential threat. And in the process, we have completely retooled our entire economy, not once, but twice. Once to ramp up military production, another time to convert back to peacetime, all in the space of six short years. So the book explores what wartime scale mobilization could actually mean. And each chapter jumps back and forth in time between stories of what Canada did during the war and, how, and, and what we now face. And in these comparisons, it answers questions like, how was public opinion rallied to support mobilization during the war? How might it be galvanized again today? What was the role of government, news media, arts and culture? How was social solidarity secured across class, race, and gender? How can we do that again? How is national unity established across Canada's many provinces with their varying interests? And can we successfully achieve that again as we move off fossil fuels? How did we collectively transform our economy and marshal all of our resources to produce what was needed? How can we do that again? How did we pay for that transformation? And can we mobilize the necessary finances once again? What supports were offered to returning soldiers? And is there a model there for just transition for fossil fuel workers today? What was the role of indigenous people in the war? What is it in today's transformation? What was the role of youth and social movements then and now? Importantly as well, what were the war's cautionary tales? The things that brought us shame, the internments, the, the squashing of civil rights, um, the poisoning of indigenous territories, and, and perhaps most relevant to the current reality, the response to refugees, the things that we don't wish to repeat. And critically, I guess as a thread through it all, what sort of political leadership do we require to see us through challenges like this? And, and I'll share one important comparison that I make right near the beginning, because it gives me some hope, and it's this, which is that despite Canada's war declaration in September of 1939, it's worth recalling that even as the winds of war gathered in the late 1930s, our leaders were reluctant to recognize what would ultimately be necessary. A lot like today, Canada was on the cusp of being completely transformed by its Second World War experience, yet right up to the 11th hour, our government still hoped to avoid getting dragged into that fight. And to my mind, that's exactly where we find ourselves today in this awkward period where Last summer, Justin Trudeau's government declares a climate emergency in the House of Commons one day and then proceeds with reapproving the Trans Mountain Pipeline the very next day. That is a dynamic that I call in the book uh, the new climate denialism, and it's a concept that I unpack in the book. But as with the war, I, I am convinced that this phony war uh, will not last and that this is today's is about to end. The book is in many respects, an invitation to our political leaders to reflect on the leaders who saw us through the Second World War and to consider 
who do they want to be and how do they wish to be remembered as we undertake this defining task of our lives. My hope is that the book might embolden them to be more politically daring than we have seen to date because that's what this moment demands. And much like the trials that tested the character of past generations, the book is really an invitation to all of us to reflect on who we wanna be as we together confront this crisis. The first chapter, just to give you a teaser, uh, I share what I see as key lessons from the Second World War, which I dubbed the battle plan for climate mobilization. It's a 14 point plan outlining what it looks like to adopt an emergency mindset and do what it takes to win. And you know, I'm not gonna go through all 14, but maybe I'll just give you a taste of some of them. Um, one of them is around the very adoption of an emergency mindset and, and what becomes possible when we do that. And one of the key signs of that is when we adopt an emergency mindset, governments take actions that are mandatory replacing voluntary measures that merely incentivize change. You rally the public at every turn. I think all of us in this pandemic have gotten a taste of what it looks and sounds and feels like when our government is actually speaking and mobilizing us in emergency terms. And it makes for such a stark contrast with the sort of lackadaisical communications uh, when it comes to the climate emergency. Another important lesson is that inequality itself is toxic to social solidarity and mass mobilization. So the book deals with the connections between climate action and inequality and argues for why linking these crises is central uh, to winning. It certainly was during the war. And uh, also that key to winning is, is around creating new economic institutions needed to get the job actually done. There is, I, I try to tell the story in the book of this remarkable feat where as a country before World War II, there was almost, there was basically nothing in the way of military production. Um, and yet the, the speed and scale of what actually occurred uh, was jaw dropping. Um, uh, Canada produced 800,000 military vehicles in those six years, more than Japan, Italy, and Germany combined. Uh, 16,000 uh, aircraft, ultimately producing the fourth largest air force in the world. Uh, almost se about 700 ships, big ships, all in the space of, of uh, those six years. Remarkably, the Canadian government, under the leadership of this guy, C.D. Howe, he was the minister responsible for all of this military production. And he was no lefty, by the way. He, he was on the right wing of the Liberal Party. He established 28 crown corporations in the course of the war to meet the supply and munitions requirements of that war effort. Um, and I think the climate emergency demands a similar approach. We have to conduct a, an inventory of our conversion needs, determine how many heat pumps, solar arrays, wind farms, electric buses that we are gonna need to electrify virtually everything and end our reliance on fossil fuels. And then we're gonna need a new generation of crown corporations to ensure that those items are manufactured and deployed at the requisite scale. Another key lesson is that governments need to spend what it takes to win. Again, we, we've had a taste of this in the COVID uh, response, um, but it still pales into com in comparison to what the government did in the Second World War. As I mentioned off the top, Indigenous leadership rights and title are central to winning. I really believe that as our mainstream politics dithers and dodges on meaningful and coherent climate action over and over and over again, it is the assertion of indigenous rights and title that is effectively buying us time, slowing and blocking new fossil fuel projects until such time as our mainstream politics comes into alignment with what the science says we have to do. And a final lesson I'll note, I call leave no one behind. Um, and that really speaks to the fact that we need a robust, just transition plan. And many of us wonder, you know, uh, as I've given book events in the, over the last two months, you know, everyone comes back to the question of jobs and rightly so. And that's a big job. It's a particularly a big job in places like Alberta and Saskatchewan and Newfoundland, where there's a heavy re employment reliance on the fossil fuel sector. But consider this, in the second world war, we were a population at the time of about 11 million people. Over a million Canadians enlisted into military service and even more 
were employed in munitions production. That is far, far more than are employed in the fossil fuel industry today. And what we did at the time to train up and then reintegrate all those people is we, we had uh, huge income support programs, housing support programs, post-secondary and training uh, and apprenticeship programs that, that transformed post-secondary education in the country for a generation and, and transformed the lives of thousands of people. I think the ambition of those initiatives provides a model for what a just transition can and should look like today. And I'll conclude my opening comments with this. Like many of you, as I read the latest scientific warnings, I'm afraid. In particular, I feel deep anxiety about the state of the world that we are leaving our kids and those who will live throughout most of this century and beyond. All of us who take seriously these scientific realities wrestle with despair. That is the ambiguous time in which we live. The truth is we don't know if we're gonna win this fight, if we will do what we need to do in time. But it's worth appreciating and often I think we, we lose sight of this. It's, it's to state the obvious, but, but we forget because we know how that story ended. It is worth appreciating that those who rallied in the face of fascism 80 years ago, likewise, didn't know if they would win. There was a good chunk of the war's early years during which the outcome was far from certain. And yet that generation rallied regardless and in the process surprised themselves by what they were capable of achieving I think that's the spirit that we need today. And uh, I'll stop there, Megan, and, and, and we can chat some more. Great. Thank you so much, Seth. Yeah, it's definitely a very scary and challenging fight ahead of us, but you're absolutely right that we need to, we need to try and work within the fact that it's all unknown. So I did prepare some questions that we can go through now, and I'd encourage everybody as we're, as we're chatting, uh, drop your questions in the Q&A so we can add them in at the end. So, First, let's talk about policy. So for a long time now, uh, discussions of climate policy have been very dominated by discussions of market-based economic instruments, uh, such as carbon pricing. So can you talk more for us on the importance of visionary climate plans in which the government mobilizes a comprehensive cross-industry approach? And how will this help us to reach our emission targets more effectively than just using market-based policies? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that question. So one of the themes within the book is that neoliberal thinking and assumptions have really been holding us back from what we need to do. They, they function as a kind of straitjacket, uh, preventing us from undertaking the kinds of policies and actions that I outline in the book. And you know, one of the challenges that we face is that we're trying to take on this challenge with the legacy of 40 years of, of neoliberalism. And, and that legacy, when I think about what is the most insidious um, piece of that legacy, it's not the spending cuts or the tax cuts or the deregulation or the privatization, it's the sapping of our ambition and our sense of what is possible to do grand things together. Um, and when I, when I mentioned to you off the top, you know, that all we've managed to do is flatline our emissions, well, why is that? And I, I am convinced that a big part of that is that if you look at all the federal and provincial actions to date on climate, the best that they do is try to incentivize change. So as you say, we give price signals, we encourage, we give rebates. That's not what you do in an emergency. That's not what you do in a war. You mandate change. And so a big part of this is shifting from voluntary measures to setting clear mandated dates. So just to give you an example, we would say, you will not be able to buy a new fossil fuel vehicle as of 2025. You would say, as of next year, no new buildings, residential or commercial, will be able to tie into natural gas for heating. By the way, the city of Vancouver, and I'm biased on this because my, my wife is a Vancouver city councilor who moved the climate emergency plan in Vancouver, but they are making, they, they, have let, they have legislated just that. No new buildings will be able to use natural gas for space and water heating as of next year. So you would set these early targets. You would set those kinds of mandatory targets for every uh, industrial sector. But also, you know, I, I put a lot of emphasis and I mentioned this in the key lessons 
you spend what you what it takes to win and you create new economic institutions to get the job done part of why i emphasize the importance of these crown corporations and the new generation of crown corporations of which i i list three pages of them is in the absence of that the best that policy can do is try to incentivize somebody else to do what's required um, rather than us simply saying ourselves through our governments, let's just do it. Um, and that's what I think we need to do. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. So to, to follow up on that question, uh, what contribution then do you feel proportional representation has to play in enabling this kind of visionary action to happen rather than sort of the tepid uh, playing it safe flavor of politics that we tend to see in majoritarian legislatures. Mm -hmm. So the book kind of walks through many barriers to bold climate action. And I certainly believe and say in the book that our current first past the post system is a barrier to, to ambitious climate action. And that, and that proportional representation would certainly make progress easier. I don't want to overstate that I, I, because I don't think that switching to proportional representation is a vital ingredient, but it would certainly help. Um, and and to, to say why, maybe the easiest way of answering this would be to flip it and to, to, to offer four reasons why I think our current system holds us back. One is that it paints this false map, of a uh, political map of our country. Uh, and a false story about our political culture. And so, for example, you're left thinking, if you just look at the election results, is that Alberta and Saskatchewan are solidly blue and opposed to climate action. Except that's not true. About a third of those people voted for parties that did want climate action. Um, and so our, the first past the post system both tells an untrue story about who we are and what we want. Uh, and it also complicates another barrier to change, which is the structure of Canadian Confederation and it amplifies all of those challenges. So that's number one. Number two is that, I mean, as all of you who, who, who care rightly passionately about this topic know, is that first past the post prevents people from voting their values. You know, it, it, it means people simply vote for the lesser of evils um, and it creates these two horse races that are far from compelling. Third is, is that problem around the pendulum swings. And you were just alluding to this, that, that our current system produces these swings between false majorities um, and, and with it, these policy lurches. So, you know, Ontario starts to take action with Kathleen Wynne and then undoes all of that with Doug Ford. Alberta starts to take action uh, modestly with Rachel Notley and then has it all done undone by Jason Kenney, and, and pardon my language, we don't have time for this bullshit. We need, for, we need forward momentum on the climate file, uh, not, not those kinds of back and forth shifts. Um, whereas in contrast, proportional representation offers that forward momentum and policies that stand the test of time. And the fourth reason I would say is that our current system undermines faith in democracy. We all know that it's tied to lower voter turnout. It's tied to lower voter turnout uh, among the young in particular. Um, at the very moment that we need those young voters, especially, um, and at the very moment when we need to rebuild faith in our collective capacity to rise to this challenge. Fantastic, thank you. So, Putting aside some theoreticals for now, so we can kind of acknowledge that the Green Party and the NDP have the most ambitious climate policy platforms out of the four major parties. So how do you feel the chances to achieve the proposals made in your book would change under a system that a lot of these parties, their fair share of seats? Well, as I say, having some form of PR would certainly be a help. Um, so first of all, if you look at the global landscape, um, all of the countries that are sort of leading on climate use some form of PR. Norway, Sweden, Ireland, New Zealand, Denmark, Finland, Ireland. Um, I said Ireland twice. Uh, 
I mean, the sole exception would be the UK, which is certainly doing better than Canada is and, and yet uses a system like ours, but all the others, some form of PR. Um, secondly, it helps because PR almost always produces minority governments. And that's great um, because those minority governments tend to rely on green or, and or progressive parties that push this along. Um, I'm speaking to you from British Columbia, where we're about to have an election on Saturday, which I wish we weren't having. Um, but we have had three and a half years under this confidence and supply agreement between the NDP and the Greens, a minority outcome. I have, and as, as I say in the book, uh, I have lots of critiques of BC's climate plan, but it is the high watermark as far as climate plans in Canada. And there is no doubt in my mind that it would not be what it is if the NDP didn't have to also accommodate the Greens. Um, uh, there's also a, a couple other important connections. I, I mentioned off the top uh, among the lessons is that inequality is toxic to social solidarity and mass mobilization. And what we also know from the data is that countries with PR also tend to have less inequality. And so that helps in terms of the mobilization that is now needed. Um, and we also know that PR produces better voter turnout, particularly among the young. And as I say, we need those people. So um, it would be a help. And, and, and in the end, uh, in, there's a chapter in my book. I, so I commissioned some original polling from Abacus data for my book. And it was quite hopeful results, actually, that really show a, pub, a public that is ahead of our politics when it comes to climate action. Um, ready for bold action, gets the emergency. But of course, that's split between four parties. Um, and some having PR would give political expression to the reality that a solid majority of Canadians want bold climate action. Absolutely. And that was great research done, the abacus data. I use that in many an essay in my master's. So thank you Good. so much for that. <laughs> I'm glad. Um, okay, so next, um, maybe you can tell us uh, what challenges you see proportional representation not being able to overcome in the pursuit of better climate action. So for example, the neoliberal hegemony may be very difficult to dismantle even with proportional representation since it is present to some degree in the policies of all four major parties. Yes, well, that's a very important point. Um, and yeah, I, I don't want people to, to think from what I'm saying that PR is some miracle cure, it's not. Um, my book outlines many barriers to change, some of which are helped by PR, but not all. Uh, in particular, the one that you've just said, it, there's nothing about PR that inherently frees us from the straitjacket of neoliberal thinking. Um, and as you note, you know, these are zombie ideas that have infected all political parties, including the NDP and the Greens. Um, you know, we're having an election right now in British Columbia, and the Green platform is better on climate than the NDP platform, but it is still not a climate emergency plan. And it still does not undertake the level of investment and spending I'm saying is needed. It still does not create the new economic institutions I'm saying are needed. Why? Uh, because it still accepts a whole bunch of fiscal assumptions around th that are embedded in neoliberalism. Um, so I'm arguing for a wartime and emergency mindset. Um, it doesn't inherently require a minority government to do that although I think it helps. Um, you know, it's interesting, in World War I, Canada had a unity government. In World War II, Britain had a minority, uh, a, a unity government, uh, but Canada did not. The Mackenzie King government had a solid majority right through the war, and yet still was able to pivot and adopt this emergency mindset and do these remarkable things that, that right up until the war, you couldn't imagine this gang ever adopting, and yet they did. And they did it under majority, although certainly the, the, the growth of the CCF was nipping at their heels. It doesn't fix the challenges of confederation that I enumerate in the book. Um, and importantly, uh, and I'll end with this, is that there's nothing inherent about PR that, that 
stems the power and influence of the fossil fuel industry, which has blocked so much progress. Uh, and that is still, you know, even in British Columbia, even under a minority NDP government in a power sharing arrangement with the Greens, the power and influence of the fossil fuel industry uh, has remained remarkably strong. Yep, I completely agree. Okay, so let's talk a bit of strategy now and try to get our optimism up a bit. So what do you feel are some of the strategies to get electoral reform, not only on the agenda again, but uh, properly adopted this time? And um, is there anything maybe that's different about our current political and social climate in 2020 that could help us in this mission that might not have been present before? Well, sadly, in my own province, I think it's off the agenda for a while, having, having la lost the referendum a couple of years ago. I do think the federal minority context gives us an opening that we have to make uh, the most of. And I absolutely agree with your call off the top. Uh, which is that um, uh, we should be pushing for a citizen assembly. And I actually, it's interesting because uh, um, I think we're in good company calling for um, citizen assemblies. Uh, Extinction Rebellion, which is this group that's taken off in the last couple of years on the climate front, also calls for the widespread use of, of uh, citizen assemblies. And within in both Ireland and the UK, the governments there have adopted citizen assemblies to tackle climate. And in, in many ways, these citizen assemblies can provide political cover for a government uh, that isn't otherwise willing or able to be as ambitious as it needs to be. Um, so I think we, we, we should be employing citizen assemblies both for climate and electoral reform it may be possible to strike them to tackle both um, as sort of challenging political or policy issues that um, where I think, you know, the record, the positive record out of BC in, in the 2001 to 2005 period with our experience of a citizen assembly is that the public is clearly prepared to um, trust and respect their fellow citizens deliberating thoughtfully in a way that they don't trust their politicians. And so I think if we can get a citizen assembly, if they recommend uh, PR, it, it just has the possibility to, um, uh, to gain acceptance in a way th that it won't happen without it. And if I can mention one other electoral piece, which isn't exactly PR, but you know, it's another form of electoral reform that I talk about in the book, I have long, long believed that the voting age should be lowered to 16. Um, uh, and in fact, there's an interesting parallel there with the war, which is that uh, about 70% of the people who enlisted in Canada in the war were under the age of 21, which meant that even though we could send them abroad to fight and die by the thousands, what they couldn't do is vote because the federal voting age was 21 until 1970. And that's what we're seeing again is another generation of young people mobilizing in our collective defense um, who are not yet enfranchised. Completely agree. Um, just a note for everybody listening, if you're not familiar with the idea of citizens assemblies, we have a whole bunch of information on our website. Uh, definitely the Fair Vote Canada website has a lot of great info that you can learn from there. Um, so just to sort of incorporate a follow-up into this, one sort of strategy that's been thrown around recently is the one-time alliance. Are you familiar with this as a proposal? No. Okay. Well, tell me. Um, so the one-time alliance uh, is sort of a proposal by advocates um, of a range of issues, I think mainly PR, uh, in which the Greens and the NDP would form an alliance to only run one candidate per riding in order to gain more seats, doing what you have to do basically under first past the post to gain more seats so that you can finally have enough seats in, in legislature to make the change to really make it the last yeah. election under first past the post. Uh, I mean, I wasn't familiar with it by that name, but I have long advocated for that kind of strategic collaboration in the interests of gaining PR. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's been some lobbying uh, towards the, the leaders of the NDP and the Greens, but I'm not sure if it's going to, well, there's a lot of animosity. There I've done that. a bunch of it myself for far yeah. too long. 
<laughs> Great. Okay. So because we can't have a webinar during the COVID pandemic without talking about COVID, I have a COVID question for you. Uh, so how do you think COVID has changed the landscape for both uh, pro-rep advocacy and climate action advocacy? And um, do you think that transformative change is more likely now, or perhaps maybe it's um, less likely due to a crowding out of less pressing issues? A um, bit of both. Uh, it certainly has changed the landscape. Um, and of course, the timing of it was uh, was interesting with respect to my book. I, I had uh, I had sent off my book for final copy at it three days before the pandemic broke. And the book, of course, the whole presumption of the book <laughs> was that we needed an historic reminder of how quickly we're capable of changing um, and pivoting, um, only to now have all of us living uh, and experiencing this in real time. Um, and it's true that in the near term, the pandemic pushes everything else off the front burner, whether it's electoral reform or climate. Um, but I actually believe that it also makes certain things more possible um, and things that are important to climate change. Um, our, our, our respect for science is at a new, as an, as at a new high. Our appreciation for the role of government and public services is at a new high. Um, Nonpartisan cooperation and national collaboration is probably at a generational high. Um, all of these are necessary ingredients for what we now need to do with respect to the climate. Um, and I think there's actually quite widespread agreement that when it comes to economic recovery, it's gonna to have to be state-led for the simple reason that the private sector is in no position. It's been too whacked, you know, households and private business just aren't gonna be up for it. And so it's gonna be led by state investment. And then the real debate becomes, well, what form will that investment take? Will it be investment to rebuild the old or will it be investment to catapult us into the new to, to somehow hypercharge the transition uh, that we now need to make and decarbonize. So obviously I, I hope it's the latter. Um, and I think, you know, people come out of this where they want to see a level, of, a new level of cooperation. They want to see a new level of citizen engagement. Um, uh, so those are all pieces of that help, but big picture, when you look at the level of spending that's happened and in particular, you know, the massively underreported is this incredible role of the Bank of Canada, by the way, just to get really wonky for a second. Uh, the role of the Bank of Canada has been unlike anything we've seen since the war. Uh, they, are, they are buying $5 billion in government securities a week. Um, and, and their level of, uh, of uh, the amount of public debt, federal debt that is held by the Bank of Canada has gone from 15% to over 30% since March. Um, that is remarkable. Um, and what it lays bare, I mean, really the cat's out of the bag. They have shown us what was possible all along with respect to homelessness or the climate, if we had seen these things as the emergencies that they are. Absolutely. And uh, in the, in the Q&A section, we did have a question uh, that I asked, uh, does modern monetary theory provide a way to fund the mobilization needed? And I wasn't gonna ask it because I don't think a lot of people are familiar with MMT, but maybe you wanna comment on that briefly. Well, I don't, I don't pretend to be an expert in MMT either, but what we are clearly seeing in the pandemic is that the government is capable of basically printing money, right? We're, we're effectively, all of the spending that the federal government is now doing is, is in the form of bonds that are bought by our own central bank that we are all the collective owner of. So not only are the interest rates historically lower than ever, less than 1%, a fraction of 1%, but any interest we pay, we pay back to ourselves because any returns of the Bank of Canada at the end of the year go back to the treasury. And the risk, you know, that, you know, all of the conservative economists who for years warned against this kind of thing said, well, you can't do that because it would be inflationary. Well, find me an economist 
who thinks that we face inflationary pressure right now, or that the value of our currency would collapse. Well, it isn't, in part because all governments are doing this. Uh, so uh, it is clearly shown that we are capable of running very large deficits uh, for an extended period of time uh, to spend what we need to spend to rise to this challenge. Great, thanks so much. So we're getting so many great questions in the Q&A, so I'm gonna start uh, sharing some of them. One that we've been getting in a few different forms is uh, just in reference to how challenging it is to overcome uh, or break out of the system of first that passed the post. So how do we break out of first past the post if the politicians who have to make that choice on our behalf are elected under that system? Well, this, I mean, that is why it's been so hard. Um, and we've seen it again in Quebec most recently where everyone seemed to promise it. And then as soon as uh, the CAQ gets a majority, they don't act on it um, because nobody wants to act. And of course, that's what happened with Trudeau in 2015 when he made a similar promise and then didn't uh, liked and then decided he liked how the current system delivers a majority. Um, and so I, I do think realistically that the only time we're going to win this is going to be uh, in the context of, uh, of a minority. Now you are frozen for me, I'm afraid. I don't know if it's at your end or my end. No, it looks to be on Megan's end. Okay. So why don't I <laughs> take one of the questions from the Q and A here? She must be coming back soon. Um, sorry, I didn't have a question prepared. Who knew Megan was going to disappear for a second? Yeah, I'm looking at the Q&A myself now in that case. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, if you see one you want to grab. Um, I know specifically for us here in Ontario, there's uh, new news that Premier Ford is passing legislation to prevent municipalities from changing their first pass the post voting system to ranked ballot. He kind of tacked that on to an omnibus bill. Um, do you have any comments on this legislation? Uh, well, I also saw that last night and it's, uh, what can I say um, to those of you in Ontario? It's, uh, it's appalling. <laughs> um, particularly, it, I mean, it, it appears that London, Ontario's experiment has been widely appreciated and, and, uh, and deeply engaging to people. So why the government would be trying to squash that rather than replicate it is, uh, well, it's surprising, but not surprising. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, do you think we should hold a National Citizens Assembly on how we should, could support the global migration uh, uh, that will take place because of climate change? Well, so I recommend in the book that we use Citizen Assembly uh, to, to figure out a path forward on, on how we meet certain targets, um, uh, but that not, that we, that, and when you look at what the UK has done and what Ireland has done, they're using citizen assemblies to, as I say, to try to map out how to achieve certain targets, but not the targets. The targets are set in law and are guided by science. Um, on the matter of using it for how we respond to uh, climate migration and refugees, that makes me very weary, wary, I should say, <laughs> weary and wary. Um, because I don't believe rights issues should be uh, uh, put to democratic votes. Um, there is a, a chapter or a section in the book that, that uh, is this historic reminder of how shamefully Canada dealt with the question of, of refugees during the war. And the reason why I'm telling that tale is I think the question of global migration will be one of the defining issues and tests of the next half century. And, um, you know, I cite, I cite uh, Cindy Blackstock, who, this, you know, fantastic uh, Indigenous child welfare advocate that many of you will be familiar with. I heard her give a speech 
uh, in Vancouver years ago in which she offered this very simple definition of reconciliation. She said, reconciliation means not having to say you're sorry twice, meaning learning from our mistakes and resolving to do it differently. Um, when you look at all of those awful violations of human and civil rights in the Second World War, whether it was the turning away of refugees or the internment of over 20,000 Japanese Canadians, these, uh, sadly, these were incredibly popular moves on the part of the government. Um, so, uh, no, I wouldn't want to put those um, uh, to a vote. I, I understand that citizen assembly is different. And so some sort of engagement is necessary. Um, and some sort of deliberation is necessary, but, I, but it would need to be carefully structured. Sorry, I cut out guys, but thank you so much, Michelle, for jumping in there when my internet failed. Um, so we're getting a lot of questions as well in the Q&A in the chat about um, mobilizing public support uh, needed to address the existential crisis of climate change and some concerns over the fact that, you know, fascists and Nazis are a very tangible enemy um, for us to oppose, but sort of climate change, change is sort of a a gradual process um, in which, you know, the real enemies have done an incredible job to, to dodge the fact um, uh, to, to prevent us from realizing that they are the enemies because they have incredibly uh, well-resourced marketing departments behind them. Mm -hmm. So how do we sort of navigate that challenge? So it is a challenge and it is true that the curse of climate, uh, unlike COVID and unlike the wars, that it moves in slow motion. Um, that said, um, I guess I will, um, I take a different, uh, my take is somewhat different than the first half of that question. I think that most of us, me, myself included, before undertaking this project, we assume that at the outset of the Second World War, you know, we declared war in September of 39 and everyone was all on board and everyone understood the threat to be clear and present. And that's not true. Uh, we were not a united country uh, all keen to do this uh, at all. Neither was the government keen to do this initially. Um, uh, Mackenzie King met with Hitler a year and a half before the war and dismissed him as no serious threat. Um, uh, and even once war was declared, the, the question of whether or not we would even send troops overseas was an open question. Um, and the threat was not clear and present, it was on the other side of two oceans. And so the argument that I'm making, and incidentally, of course, it took the United States two years longer than us to, to enter the war. And they had to experience an attack on their own territory. For, for much of that time, Canada was the only country in the Western Hemisphere that was engaged in the war. Um, and so it took a combination of events and leadership to actually bring the public on board and to get the enlistment numbers that we ultimately saw. And that is the point that I'm making in the book. So what's the combination of, of events? And in, in, in the present, it's, I think, extreme weather events uh, and also political events and political leadership uh, that will uh, rally and galvanize us the way that happened there. And an important piece of that is a leadership that speaks forthrightly about the threat, right? This is what we remember about the, the World War II leaders we, we remember are those who walk this line of being forthright about the risk, but also still communicated hope. We don't have that today. None of our political leaders are being forthright with us about the nature of the challenge. They're actually tell, communicating that it's easy and you won't have to make any hard choices and that we can take climate action even as we expand fossil fuel production. That's not true. And that creates an inconsistency of message that is confusing from a mobilization point of view. So by the way, is you know, one of the things I argue in the book is we should, why do we still allow fossil fuel cars and, ga and, and gas stations to advertise? We don't do that for tobacco. It's confusing to say to people, it's an emergency and yet still allow this advertising. Absolutely, I think that's a, a great idea. 
So we have one fun little question here, um, sort of mushing two different ones together. So we had one question that asked, uh, can we fight climate change without deconstructing capitalism? And this is, this is interesting because um, I think especially the wartime response when we consider that, I think that's an example of constraining capitalism and putting significant restraints on it, um, taking a more government-led approach. Um, so what do you think on this, the, this, this menu of, of options? Well, so I'm certainly arguing in the book that climate action is incompatible with neoliberalism um, because that prevents us from doing what we have to do and spending what we have to spend and so on. Um, but when, when you look at that wartime, there's lots of interesting stuff to be pulled from that wartime experience. Um, there were a lot of private for-profit corporations who made a lot of money in the war. What they were not allowed to do is allocate, determine the allocation of scarce resources because you don't do that in an emergency. The government itself determined the allocation of scarce resources. Um, and so, as I say, C.D. Howe created 28 crown corporations whenever the private sector couldn't quickly do, he was happy to give contracts to the private sector, although he capped their profits. Um, and, but if they couldn't quickly do what he wanted done, he created another crown corporation. He was also carefully managing all the supply chains. So machine tools, rubber, silk, steel, coal, fuel, timber, all of them, all of those supplies are being carefully coordinated to prioritize wartime production. Um, and interestingly, for for over a hundred of these leading private sector executives, the role, their key role in the war was that they abandoned their private sector posts. They became the, the, the heads of these crown corporations and served as controllers of these supply chains. So there's a role, but as you say, it's very constrained. Um, it's very directed because we need to be, we need planning and we need direction. And importantly, you control the profits. When I mentioned that inequality is important for mobilization, in the First World War, there had been rampant profiteering. And that profiteering undermined social solidarity, it undermined recruitment. You know, what does it mean for some people to make a killing while others are being killed? Mackenzie King was very cognizant of this at the beginning of the Second World War. And his core objective was how do I get hundreds of thousands of people to voluntarily enlist? Because he wanted to avoid mandatory military conscription for overseas service. How do you do that? That's a formidable challenge. Well, you need social solidarity for that. So what does he do? He increases the corporate tax rate from 18 to 40%. And he brings in an excess profits tax. The kind of profiteering that we have seen in this pandemic and you know, my former colleagues at the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives a few weeks ago published a report that the 20 wealthiest Canadians have seen an increase in their collective wealth of $37 billion since the start of the pandemic. In the Second World War, that was illegal because of how toxic it is to social solidarity and mass mobilization. And we're gonna need that again. I completely agree. I'm very much hoping that's a, a policy that we see coming very soon. So we have time for a couple more questions. So I'm going to pull some out. Uh, so one interesting here that's uh, relevant to your book. Um, so do you have any thoughts on the Green Jobs Oshawa campaign and the, the reinvention of uh, Canadian uh, auto and manufacturing uh, private industry uh, put to service in developing green uh, transportation technology? Mm. Yeah, I speak to the Green Jobs Oshawa proposal in the book. I think it's very inspiring. Um, you know, we've seen interesting, inspiring examples, like there's the whole proposal for delivering community power that the LEAP and the Canadian Auto and the Canadian uh, Union of Postal Workers have come up with to reimagine Canada Post. And then you have Green Jobs at Oshawa reimagining what could have been done and what should be done with that Oshawa GM plant. Uh, I, I don't under, I mean, to me, I don't know why the federal government didn't step in. And, and frankly, they could have done this earlier when they took a huge equity stake in the financial crash of 2008-9 and they failed to use their equity stake then. But now with the company walking away, it makes no sense to me. And, and I love what they're proposing 
not only to, to, elect, to, to build electric, but to prioritize um, electrifying public fleets. Uh, fantastic. And just one last question. We're getting a few questions about um, what can we do differently about our messaging when it comes to proportional representation to be more effective and to, you know, get the message across to people that this is a, uh, an issue that has a, a multiplier effect on, uh, on so many other issues that we care about? Oh, I don't know. That's a hard one. For, 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 for a last question or one of the last questions. Well, then maybe I mean, instead you could do something, you can talk about, you know, what can, what can people do? What can we do as individuals to, to move the cause forward for, you know, climate action and other issues that are important right now? Yeah. I mean, if I, I, if, if, if I thought I knew better about the messaging, we uh, hope we might've done better in British Columbia two years ago. Um, uh, I do think, we're, you know, you're on to something collectively when you talk about going the route of, of the citizen assemblies. I think that is a really important model for both issues, climate and, um, uh, and proportional representation, because the public um, has distrust for politicians, but they are, but they do trust their fellow citizens. And you know, to the extent that we can model our fellow citizens being thoughtful and deliberative about a way forward, mm -hmm. um, people will, will uh, I mean, let me try to come back to the first part of this question. When I think back to the successful referendum we had in BC, which was in 2005, when 58% of the public voted yes, but the government had set the bar at 60%. And that was in the wake of the citizen assembly, which had, was really a remarkable process to watch. Um, and I remember at the time, so many people saying, you know, this system they're recommending, this single transferable vote, it seems really complicated and I can't really explain it, but you know, those people worked really hard and I'm gonna honor their recommendation. And 58% of British Columbians said yes. Yes, and it's an absolute tragedy. I think that the, the, the goalposts were changed after the fact. I think that's a really, that's a shame. Well, hate to end on that sad, sad note, but hopefully we can band together and uh, do more for the, the issues going forward. So it is eight o'clock now. So I want to thank everyone for setting aside the time to join us tonight. And thank you so much, Seth, for a wonderful participation in a wonderful discussion. Uh, just so everybody knows, a recording of tonight's webinar will be posted on our YouTube channel if you want to watch again or send it to a friend. And if you'd like to receive an invitation to our uh, next webinar in November, please make sure to sign up for the mailing list. Uh, and lastly, if you want to learn more about supporting the PR movement, uh, your browser will automatically take you to a page on our website showing the top 10 actions you can take to advocate for PR. So thank you everyone again for joining us tonight and we hope to see you at our next webinar in November. Good night, everyone. <laughs>